So Tyler Merkley from BARDA, thank you very much for the opportunity to come. As you mentioned, I'm the CARBAX program manager and, and really one of the co-founders of our CARBAX initiative. Um, today, I, I want to first thank the opportunity to present today. Uh, CARBAX has been on a roll. Uh, it was only in February uh, 28, 2016 that we actually launched our initiative through the government. Uh, we ordered our uh, cooperative agreement um, in July 28th, and uh, we've already had received over 350 applications and we're in the process of selecting candidates to go forward. So in, in less than a year, the initiative has moved forward very quickly. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what our CARBAX initiative is. I know some of you are interested, but there's others in the life science community. Those might be someone on the bench uh, to the CEOs of different companies here, and I want to talk a little bit about non-diluted investments and what we think more broadly at Carbax, Barta, and as you're thinking about other partners. And I realize there's also some VC members in the room, and I want to give some additional perspective in there about what you might want to think about if you're ha if funding a company or supporting a company, you made an investment in there that might be looking at a non-diluted investment. So in general, Carbex is a uh, global public-private partnership focused on antibacterial development. It's a partnership, a joint partnership, and I really like to stress this, between NIAID, the National Institute of Health, and BARDA, uh, which is a kind of the first time we've launched a co-program like this uh, in preclinical and in the clinical stage development. Um, it funds four life science accelerators with over a $350 million commitment into the antibacterial space to address and combat antimicrobial resistance um, over a five-year time with both international partnerships. Together, we're providing business and science support services uh, to, with non-diluted funding specifically to accelerate preclinical antibacterial pro, uh, candidates from early stage, kind of hit to lead through phase one for them to receive follow-on investment, whether that's public or private sector investment, to really accelerate that early stage of development. So I put this slide together specifically for this conference, but I, I really wanted to highlight the advantages, I think, of, of non-diluted investments. And, and I share this after spending seven years at BARDA and partnering and probably awarding $2 billion worth of programs and working with a lot of great companies, uh, some of you that are in the room, of what I see the benefits of non-diluted investment and if I was sitting in your situation, um, why I might want to think about that. There's obviously the financial benefits. We always think about it's free money, um, but you really want to make sure when you're thinking about who you're partnering with non-diluted, is it really free money, right? So yes, we're not taking an equity position, but we're also not taking loans. It's not a convertible debt that's going to balloon at some point. We're also not asking for any revenue sharing down the road, and that's an important aspect when you think about the long-term uh, commitment in the space. You bring your IP, you maintain your IP, you know, we're going to help accelerate that technology forward, um, but we really in general have no interest in developing a product that you don't want to develop yourself, because that means there's no commercial market in that space. Often overlooked, I think, and, and people realize this often when they partner with BARDA for a period of time later, is the non-financial benefits of a non-diluted partner. So most of the time, you're going to your VC firm, you're going to the market through an IPO, and it's all about show me the money, right? What is your return on investment for your technology you want to get to the market? In the government, we look at it a little different. We're looking for the return on investment of preparedness, right? So what is the preparedness and an unmet medical need that your technology is going to help us solve, which is why we're willing to provide non-diluted funding? So a different expectation of what the capital markets are looking for in that investment versus what your government partner is. So it's really under important to understand what are they looking for in preparedness and what are their goals to figure out how you bring those two together, the financial return on investment and also the preparedness return on investment. We have a really strong scientific um, due diligence process that we go through. And, and sometimes it can probably feel cumbersome um, when you're one of those that are applying to us. Um, but specifically with Carbex, we're, we're putting together both a scientific and business review team by bringing in our product accelerators together to really make sure that we're doing the due diligence across the portfolio. Um, so by the time the companies that we fund, we think you're going to be the cream of the cops, those that have the best products to go forward, but also have the right business and science support services around them to help. Once you get into a program, whether it's a BART or with our CARBEX program, you're going to get free consulting support services, technical support services, and we're really focused on interim milestone decisions, right? And the reason this is important is when you're in early stage development, you know, we have an idea of where you want to go. We need to set those milestones and say, this is our goal when we hit this point, and this is how we know if we want to double down and make a further on investment to take that product to the clinic. Or maybe we need to recognize that that isn't the right formulation, and we need to go back to the drawing board and work on a formulation. But by setting those interim milestone decisions, it's a great way for us to measure progress so we don't get a little bit of the hand waving at the end, and we can continue to move forward assets that maybe should be down selected so we can make other investments. And that's important not only for the company, but I think for the VC community. 
because when you know you're investing in a company and it's coming behind and within a CARBEX program, there's going to be that same level of due diligence that's also uh, better value for your dollars that you're investing. And, and lastly, I think one of the aspects both, and we see this a lot with BART, and I think we're going to see this with CARBEX in our initiative, is we have access to all the technologies, all the regulatory discussions that companies are happening with the FDA. So when the FDA starts and reviewers start making comments and we start seeing trends and changing, we can take that general knowledge and with that articulated about a specific company we heard it from and provide a broader market perspective of where we think regulatory organizations are going. And that's a really important perspective and an advantage to a company because you may have one person on your team that's doing quality or regulatory and they're only seeing their vision in their document. But when we look at that at BART across six different programs that have all gone into the FDA for a, a phase one program or a preclinical IND meeting and we're seeing similar trends, it allows us to strategically help position you to be more successful because in the end of the day, our goal is to get more products to the market. So. Why is BARDA interested in investing in, in antibacterial product development? Um, our program started back in 2010 with our first investment with Acagen. Um, they've been a great partner through our, our initiative. Um, but it's continued to evolve, and we're in a different place, and we have new threats and new challenges. Um, but in general, we recognize that there's 23,000 Americans that are dying a year of antimicrobial resistance, um, 70,000 deaths globally. Uh, by 2050, there's estimated there'll be 2 million or 10 million deaths a year, and a total economic value impact, if we look cumulatively across it, of $100 trillion. Simple surgeries, you know, C-sections, knee replacement, hip surgeries, a catheter being inserted, all now at risk, a high-risk profile of having in in infections. And more importantly, I think what we really see, there's a market failure. And the government comes in when the government needs to make investment is when there's failures in the market. There's obviously a failure in the antibacterial market, both in the preclinical, through the clinical development, and also the economic incentives at the end. And that's when the government's best to come in and do public-private partnerships. So at BARDA, we look at, at those kind of models. I wanted to I put a funny graphic that I didn't show the second part of this, and I always forget because it doesn't show that on my screen. But what I wanted to show here is you know, we're going to talk today about CARBAX, but recognize we think like bench to bedside at BARDA, like you think as a product developer or you think in the VC community. And that's really important. We need to do a better job across the government. And that doesn't mean I might support something later stage development, but I'm working with my ditcher partners or with my NIAD partners to transition those programs forward. But when we talk about specifically about our antibacterial program at BARDA, we have our, our broad spectrum antimicrobial program, which we call the antibacterial program. Uh, established in 2010, we spent about $1.5 billion in product development and supporting programs through the development of those assets. I think we currently have nine assets in our portfolio or even a larger amount. We have our antibacterial preclinical development program with our CARBEX initiative, which is our global public-private partnership. The goal there is to feed the beast, to feed the, pre the clinical stage development. So my customer is our antibacterial program. It's to make sure we get assets from early stage so we have a better pipeline. And lastly, which we're continuing to work on now is really thinking about what our CARB market incentives is. And, and this is a new slide. Some of you that have been to other means may not have seen this yet. But what we're truly trying to communicate here to the community, to stakeholders, to Congress, is for this to work, we don't just need push incentives. We don't need direct funding or research. We also need the market incentives, which is going to be the pull incentives, so that when you get to the market, you have a small drug that's going to have a small market, that we make sure there's entry rewards and there's a reward for getting to that stage. So our CARBI initiative has been running by Joe Larson. He's been working on this for a few years. We don't have authorization or appropriation for it yet, but it's a, it's a continued space in which we think is necessary to address the overall threat. In 2014, um, there was the opportunity to um, develop a national strategy. Uh, to combat antimicrobial resistance. And, and this is real, was a really key kind of turning point for how the U.S. government was going to handle our, our, our threat here. And, and we do national strategies for terrorism. We do national strategies for energy production. And it's really an opportunity to bring a bunch of different government agencies together that have similar scope and work, but they may not be working together, set a high-level national strategy. We then develop an implementation plan on how we're going to work to do that. And then we put metrics in those implementation plans to show that we're actually making projects and projections towards this. So this was done in 2014. These are the five goals inside it. And we had the opportunity um, in that to provide our accelerator concept into the national strategy. So a little bit about how this concept came. My boss shows up to me one day. Joe Larson says, you know, I was just at this meeting at the White House. They rely on a really novel, innovative idea about how we're going to change the model and how we're going to really 
refoster preclinical product development into the clinical development. And I had been spending a lot of time focusing on incubators and accelerators in the tech sector. I had a company that failed, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I should have done this through an accelerator or an incubator. It would have been made more sense. So I'd been studying this a lot, and I said, you know, we're not doing this enough in the life science. Obviously, there's life science accelerators out there, but in Washington, we weren't using incubators and accelerators in the same kind of partnerships that we manage. So I said, how could we bring these models together? So partnering with NIAD, talking about the threat, we put this concept in the national strategy. It was this idea that we put in there. It kind of worked its way up. And for anybody that's spending time in the government, um, trying to explain to someone that's a government wonk on what an accelerator and incubator was was quite interesting. I had all kinds of versions of what accelerator and incubator was. And it was really hard to get this concept out of the government. Everybody we went and talked to in industry goes, oh yeah, makes sense, totally, definitely something we need. So it was a really kind of interesting experience in getting this initiative launched um, through our accelerator. But it ended up in the national strategy, ended up in the implementation plan, and then in 2015, with all the challenges we had between the executive branch and, and the Congress, all of a sudden the dollars showed up for it. And we were off on a roll. So when we did our market research, we went on the program, I think there were three key capabilities that really fostered themselves that I thought was really important. And, and this gets back to our non-diluted investment. These are all the reasons we needed an accelerator, right? Um, the point about large pharma getting out, AstraZeneca, the most recent example, right, uh, of selling their, their portfolio. So obviously still a major uh, threat out there and, and still a need for it. So what could we do differently? Well, we looked at our accelerators and we said, how can we address these key gaps? One of the things we thought was really important was how do we bring scientific and business development experts together, both in a physical environment, you might be co-located in a hub, like in South Bay, right? But you also may be in a virtual space. You might be out in these locations. So how do we bring these people together and foster an environment where they can work together? Second part of this, how do we make sure that we're providing business support services and we're leveraging business accelerator experience to really drive business acumen in the companies that we're supporting? Now recognize the companies that BARDA supports and CARBEX support, one of them may have a three clinical stage assets, one of them might be a complete startup, someone might be in between. And each of those organizations are going to need different strategic business support services depending on where they need. They're going to need help with certain connections along the way. The government doesn't do this very well, right? Well, we don't understand business in the government, but industry understands that, accelerators understand that. So we're providing a public-private partnership and bringing these two models together, we take our experience in selecting candidates, we take the business community selection and providing the VC support services it needs, and we can come together and provide a better overall support services. And the last key thought we, we had was it needed to be hyper-focused. There are accelerators out there, there's incubators out there in the life science space, but no one was 100% focused just on antibacterial products to address our combating antibiotic resistance. We're not trying to do Zika tomorrow, we're not working on malaria, cardiovascular oncology, simple focus just on the funding. So we felt if we provided the physical and virtual environment, we provided the right level of expertise with the business side of it, in addition, we were hyper-focused with non-diluted dollars, it would be a key to moving forward our investment. So after a year of market research in 2015, um, we met with over 30 different organizations, both physically and uh, virtually teleconferences. Everybody from VC to small to medium to large pharmaceutical companies to other organizations that had run nonprofits with incubators, accelerators. We met with companies that had failed and hadn't gotten to the market. We wanted to know why. Um, we met with those that were successful. And what we continually heard was to refine what our initial message was, was one, yes, an accelerator is needed. And these are the risks and the things you need to think about of what a great accelerator will be. And actually, it was during that time we kind of changed the concept from an incubator to an accelerator. That we were kind of a hybrid between both, right? A little bit of physical space and, and mostly a virtual environment. Um, so after that, we got our funding from Congress. We had the opportunity to put our funding opportunity announcement. If there was ever a time for competition, this was one that was a high benefit. We had over 10 companies come in or organizations come in to apply to be CARBEX. Um, of that, we made the smart move of saying, you know, there's a lot of really good companies out here. It'd be great if some of you guys kind of came together. And that's when Boston University stepped up and four product accelerators came underneath them. So instead of getting one accelerator in CARBEX, because we ran competition, because we spent the time going out, we ended up with four product accelerators. In addition, we got an initial $100 million and potentially more 
in non-diluted funding from these partners that came in with the accelerator that we otherwise wouldn't have services. So we were able to leverage Bardo's dollars to go farther and IAD's dollars to go farther, which means we can support more product development in a more non-diluted environment, which is, is supportive. In the end, we identified we were going to select and manage a portfolio of endobacterial candidates using our four accelerators. Those are uh, Welcome Trust. AMRC Center, which is in, in um, Manchester, CLSI here in California, and MassBio in Boston. And those will be our four product accelerators. Companies will come in, they apply through Carbex, they're selected, and they'll be managed and powered by Carbex through those four different accelerators. So in year one, uh, BART is providing um, $30 million investment with an additional $41 million in coming in from our international partners at Welcome Trust and AMRC. So this is a $71 million investment, and probably you take out some administrative costs, probably 68 to $67 million in preclinical antibacterial development that wasn't out there before. These aren't dollars that aren't available. So obviously there's been a buzz, right? And we've attracted 350 applications. I thought we might get 50. So uh, a lot of interest in the program, um, but, a, but a key kind of uh, initiative as we go forward. And it, it's a five-year commitment over a period of time, and one of my, my goals is to figure out how we make this sustainable over the long run. Because I think one of the best government programs is one when you see a failed market, you go in and you incentivize it, and then you figure out how to make that program sustainable over the long run that still aligns with your core missions so you don't have to continue to put your dollars in investment. So that's one of our, our long-term strategies that we're working on. So within Carbax, these are all the different partners in Carbax. In, and in general, we have some partners that are accelerators. We have the Broad Institute that's also working on early stage products. RTI is providing uh, our, kind of our website and all our portfolio and metrics to try to make reporting a much simpler and easier for companies that apply, and so it's much more efficient, and your time is focused on science um, and not necessarily focused on reporting. We hope to have 20 different antibacterial candidates in the portfolio, and I, we use antibacterial and we use product for a reason. We're not just talking about antibiotics, right? We're talking about vaccines, we could be di devices, diagnostics, any non-traditional approach in that space. In year one, we're gonna be a little bit more conservative. You're gonna see more of your traditional approaches because we gotta get some early wins because our goal is to have two products get to the clinic. But after we meet those initial goals, I think you're gonna see our portfolio get much more novel and much more diversified after we show stakeholders that this model is working. Until then, we gotta show them progress so that we get our follow on dollars uh, to come behind. And we're leveraging a private sector approach by using accelerators to move the model forward. So what to expect from Carbex if you went specific funding, and I think, again, this is relevant that you want to think about if you're in some other life science uh, field and, and you're not coming to Carbex and you're getting non-dilute investments, what are you expecting from that partner, right? And it's not, again, just the financial support services. You know, dollars are important, but are they really providing business support services to your organization that are going to help fill the gaps? And if not, how are you leveraging those services somewhere else in the community? Are they providing scientific support services and really leveraging the knowledge in their organization to make sure you're delivering? And, and when we say world's mentor, uh, world-class mentoring support service, I really mean that. And, and if we're not doing that, my email's at the end, but if we're not being good partners with you at Carbex, if we're not providing you the right services you think we need, we're a learning organization, I wanna hear from you uh, to make sure that we're constantly involved in our organization and moving, and moving forward. Um, but those are what you can expect. This is a little bit about governance, just to quickly, there's a joint oversight committee, which is kind of like a board of directors, it's uh, over top of Carbex, and that group is really responsible for portfolio allocation, kind of our, our balancing of our portfolio, our selection, milestone to support decisions of whether we're gonna make continued investments in technology, and really setting our beta and risk tolerance, right? And again, that was the point I was making earlier. We're gonna be a little less risk averse in the first year or two, but as we have early wins, we'll be able to be, take a more novel approach and really focus on more non-traditional approaches and, and a more novel than, you know, the, the gram negative, novel gram negative we haven't had in 45 years. Uh, so a, a pivot over a period of time. On the scalability side, you know, Carbex is, is a model that we took from the tech sector, right? A model we already took from the life science accelerator. Accelerators and incubators have been around for a long time. We think there's some core principles that are gonna make Carbex special and why it's gonna be successful again because we're hyper-focused on, on the threat we're giving the funding the business support service, but this could be worked for emerging infectious diseases. It could be supported for influenza. It, the National Institute of Health could use this model for a, another program. Uh, so completely scalable model um, that we think in great in the government when you have really hard challenges that you potentially need to overcome and you need to bring industry and the public together. This is quickly our uh, priorities for year one. 
um, hit to lead candidates up to phase one. Again, remember, we looked at that first chart. We showed you the preclinical development stage. We have a later stage program for clinical development. In addition, um, NIAID is also funding kind of the late preclinical stage into clinical stage development. Uh, so a, a success of a CARB-X program is someone that graduates out and it gets follow-on investment, whether it's public, private, you do the licensing agreement, you move forward. That's how we're going to look at wins is what is leaving CARB-X and when for follow-on investment. Um, SCOPE will fund any program anywhere that's the best programs. Uh, we don't care where you are geographically in the world. Uh, you know, you come to Carbax, we find you. We're going to fund those programs because we need worldwide solutions to solve the problems. Um, this year, we're having a smaller percentage of our portfolio. Only 10 to 15 percent is going to be kind of non-traditional diagnostic devices prevention. But again, we're going to see that population. I hopefully increase as we go forward in views and a little bit about our minimum criteria. So, you know, lastly talking about you know, what has been the success of CARBEX. Well, I would say in our cycle one and cycle two applications, we had over 350 applications. Um, again, I thought we might have 50 or 60. When the first group came in, cycle one had 162. We were like, wow, this is gonna be a lot of work. It's been a little slower. I mean, still in six months to be able to move through these applications has been pretty impressive. Um, and it says a lot about the Boston University team and the CARBEX team that's been running this. Because I can tell you in the government, we couldn't run through 350 applications in six months. Um, and, and of that group, you know, there's gonna be a handful in our cycle one. We're gonna have a launch event in March uh, 2016. And that's gonna be the first opportunity to really uh, present um, who has been uh, funded by us. And um, I think you're going to see some really strong companies and really strong technologies. And Cycle 2, um, which will most likely be funded sometime in September 2017, is also going to have a lot of strong companies. So some great companies in here. Um, we're excited about the opportunity. This is a little bit where we currently are in the process. If someone's applying, this is our Cycle 1. We're at the end of the uh, the, the short form. And, and one thing I guess I forgot to, to mention I want to say is our powered by CarbEx flow. For those of you in the VC community, you might be interested in making investments um, in this space. Start looking for the powered by CarbEx. This is actually a licensing agreement between who we fund in CarbEx will be able to use this logo. They can put it on their website and their promotional material. But it really establishes that this is a program that's being funded by CarbEx. It's being powered. It means it's gone through the vetting process um, of Welcome Trust, NIAID, and BARDA, and it's really one of the cream of the crops of the technology to move forward. So similar to your Starbucks cup, cup logo, you can potentially see this licensing agreement, and it's going to tell you that these are the companies um, that are getting non-diluted investment from Carbax. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come. I hope I highlighted how this could be a global public-private partnership, obviously for our antibacterial space, but more broadly for other technologies when we have really tough challenges with failed markets that the government needs to step in and public-private private partnerships, and I hope I gave kind of an overview of both the financial benefits of non-diluted investment, but also some of the non-tangible, non-financial benefits of the programs um, that you might want to consider, whether you're applying to CARBEX or to BARDA, to any of our other uh, government partners. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. We do provide respiratory drug delivery of that antibiotic, and that's really an important part of the program. How does that fit into the program? We, um, we're definitely interested in platform technologies that, that develop products. Um, one of the challenges we always have is make sure that you have a product that you can prove uh, that you're actually delivering and showing a benefit. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. I have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one scheduled today. Um, but definitely platform technologies are important. Uh, the real challenge is you got to make sure you have a product you can show a proof of concept with with that technology and then think about your regulatory approach of moving this forward. But definitely a, a, a something in the space we're looking at, it's just important to have some proof of concept data with an actual asset that you're going to use a synergy with. Good. What sort of selectivity are they using in terms of broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum? So I, I showed our priorities of our uh, the serious and CDC serious and urgent threat list. Um, that's what we're really using at BARTA right now to say where do we want our, our investments that need to be on the urgent or serious threat. Obviously, there's some broad spectrums that provide advantage against some of those threats. Other ones, you need to be very specific. I think we're trying to find that balance. Um, you know, the government looks at this uh, a little bit more from an unmet medical need, so we're looking at where we have gaps. So you might say, well, there's not many people dying of, of CRE, but you're making a large investment. Why do you make? Well, because there's no other technology. So it's a little different than how, again, the industry looks at where's the return on investment. I want to invest in C. diff. That's the place I want to be or on another 
MRSA drug up until we got five approved now, right? Um, but, you know, we're looking a little differently as, okay, the market's already moved to C. diff. Do we really need another antibiotic or do we want a different prevention strategy there? And likewise, so we're, we're trying to kind of be a little bit earlier in risk. Once the market gets there and it's being supported, we may phase off our development and pivot to what we think is the next threat to help that market get forward. And then again, once it's sustainable and it gets that investment and the VC dollars are there and you can prove you can get a return, then we'll shift. And, that, and that's part of what we're trying to do at the government is constantly find that balance of where our dollars go the farthest to, again, address the element medical need and enhance preparedness. Thank you. Could you comment on the resubmission fail times for those who are in the short term? No, I can't. Um, but there will be more data coming out, and I would just point you to the CARBAX website. In addition, um, you know, there will be a process, and I think those will be coming out shortly. Um, we're continuing working through to make this the most efficient for everybody. And one of the exciting things about is we have a new back-end website tool that we're being developed. It's, again, going to make the evaluation process and the reporting process better. Anybody that's reported to BARDA over the years and knows how our process is all paper-based, we're trying to make this more electronic-based and more portfolio-based so that we can look at this as a portfolio and see all the progress where our priorities are. So it takes a little while to get there, but I think it's going to be pretty exciting. And it's going to not just be a benefit to us looking at the portfolio, but it's going to be a benefit to the companies. So cycle two applications are all going through our electronic-based system. That's why it's taking a little bit longer. Um, they just went through their expression of interest, and everything was done electronically. So it's been pretty exciting as we move forward. We're using two-factor to make sure that everything is secure with the data you put in. Yes, sir. Does Carbex have any interest in phage? Yes. Uh, we put that on our non-traditional approach. And again, I, I'd remind you, I think you're going to see a little bit more conservative approach with the traditional approaches in, out of year one and cycle, our cycle two. In year three, or year two, which will start in August, we're going to, and what we we're calling cycle three, we're going to be much more targeted in what we're looking for. And the reason we're doing that is we're, we have an empty portfolio now, right? We're building the portfolio, then we're going to do an assessment of where that portfolio is and say, where do we want to shift? So it's going to be a much more targeted focus on there. And I think you're going to see a higher emphasis on our non-traditional approaches in there. Again, this year we were only looking at 10 to 15 percent, um, which is what the JOC felt was an appropriate balance for year one. And we hope that will continue to push up over a period of time. Yes, sir. For like a company, so I mean, what does it cost you to between hit to lead up to phase one, right? So think about your general cost of those different stages of development. We ask for a minimum of a 20% cost share associated with that. Um, that's a minimum. Um, but you know, Carbex was never meant to be a sole funding source. I had a great graph when we started this that showed like, you know, I met too many companies that told me, well, why are you doing this? Well, because this one funder wants this and I got this grant, so I gotta go this way, and then I gotta come back over here. And you start realizing early stage development, it's, it's not efficient, right, because you're moving around. Our goal was you already had a grant, you may already have your Series A, we're coming over and providing more capital. To the VC, that's great if we come in after you, we're not diluting your investment. If we get in before you, it provides a validation that this technology might be something you want to invest in. In addition, you now know that if you meet these milestones, because we've committed to these programs, and as long as the program goes forward, funding's available, your program should move forward into the clinic, which is a value. So it's, it's really based on each individual company. I'm seeing a lot of difference in the cost share. But like anything else, you want, want to be competitive, right? And I, I want to fund more as many programs as I can. Um, so it's, it's a balance. It's, it's not 100% CARBAX providing the funding. We want to see some skin in the game. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we've, we've continually shifted in, in, in BARDA, you know, from day one where we funded 100% of things, but we really weren't because the companies were still funding things on their own, to now saying, let's put all the chips on the table, all the costs out there. You guys say, this is what you're covering, we're covering this. Um, in those programs, and we're doing this with Carbex, even though we might only be covering 20% of that invoice, or 75% of the invoice, depending on how the numbers work, we still want to be involved in anything. And I think one of the key things we found at BART is if when you say, I'm funding this and you're funding that, we don't communicate, you gotta communicate in drug development, right? Because we gotta understand the broader picture. So what we've now layered into BARDA, which I've then taken and put into CARBAX, is the concept that we're working on this all together, it's in scope. This is the percentage of costs that we're breaking down so that our drug development teams and teams working with our accelerators understand the broader vision you're going so they can help you throughout the whole development. They're not just focused on a specific animal study or a specific CMC package. Yep. Yes. I stress that. Yeah. 
Yes, in, in general, um, our focus is on the serious and urgent threats, mostly focus on the gram negatives associated with that. We do not think we need to invest in another skin drug. We think there's a commercial market out for skin drug and the products that have got, gotten to approval. Um, that doesn't mean we might not support a gram positive if it was in a specific space, but in general, that's where it is that we're looking to make our investments because that's where we think the community needs those investments the best. It doesn't mean that they don't need them in another gram positive, but we think that's where the greatest unmet medical need threat is, and that's why we're investing taxpayers' dollars in those spaces. Yes? Um, I don't want to get into all the technicals of that, but I think, yes, there's definitely an opportunity. Again, what we are looking for is that you have skin in the game or someone else has skin in the game. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's a specific amount. I think you really focus on, first of all, is there scientific merit and business support services that we can provide? Is that the kind of partnership? Um, if I was in a situation with that, I might highlight that we have a partner that's come in that's providing dollars, and therefore, when we get out of here, we have a more successful potential graduation because X company has partnered into that. Um, but, uh, you know, each of those things we look at differently, and it's the overall package. And at the end of the day, you're going in front of a board of directors. Think about it like going in front of the VC. You want to have your absolute best package, your best foot forward that you can put forward because, you know, there's only limited dollars that we can support with programs going forward. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, it depends on what cycle you're in. Um, I would say that cycle one took us a little longer than we wanted to. We'd like to condense this, but when you have 160 applications and you need to provide credible responses and evaluations of those and give feedback to people so they can make changes, it takes a period of time. I think we had over uh, 30 reviewers reviewing these programs across government and industry sector, uh, nonprofits, uh, and um, our accelerator teams. So, um, you know, I think we did the initial expression of interest on September 2nd. Uh, we had feedback to people by mid-October. They were then, most of them got submitted in the short forms that were due in end of October. We went through a short form review in November. Feedback went to full, or the long form in uh, first of December, and they had to submit their applications a couple weeks ago. Um, so, you know, or actually in December. So, and they're gonna do long form. So, I mean, in the end, I think we're gonna have these funded by March, and we started September 1st, I mean, six months. Matt, did we ever do anything that fast in Bardo when you were there? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's pretty efficient. Maybe one or two, but not 150, you know. So, yeah. So I just, you know, it takes time, you know, but we, we, we want to make sure that we're selecting the right companies, but we also don't want to be, you know, 50% of these products are going to fail, right? We all know where we are in early development. It's probably higher than that. So we can't be so focused that we're trying to improve it from 55 to 51%, and then we take a year and a half to make approvals. So, you know, we recognize there's a lot of risk at this stage, so our idea is to get dollars out, do the research, have good milestone decisions, and then decide down select from there. At the same time, we don't want to drag people along that, with it, you know, we don't think are going to be potentially fundable, because that's time and dollar investment for you as a company. Uh, so we're trying to make those selection processes as early as we can, so we're not stringing people out for six months with no chance of getting funded. Yes. Great question. Um, conflicts of interest is challenging, uh, and it's, a, it's always a balance uh, between wanting to get industry experts on the table that actually know how to develop one of these products, um, by, but also managing conflicts of interest in process. Uh, CARBAX developed a specific conflict of interest policy um, that we're implementing to manage that process. Um, in addition, you know, we obviously have the recusals, the same thing the government would use in recusals and financing through the process. A lot of reviewers might be reviewing four out of six of the proposals they had because they have conflicts with something, they're self-identifying those conflicts. We have a conflict manager within CARBEX that's responsible for managing and monitoring. And then once we identify you have potentially a conflict, I mean, sometimes you know it, other times it comes in after technology, you're like, well, I'm gonna have a conflict with that. We're making sure to track all those and firewall so that same reviewer isn't used and we move them around. So all of a sudden, one of the advantages of having some nonprofits, some retired individuals that no longer have financial interest in the models, so that we can, if, if someone has a lot of conflicts, we can move technologies around. But
But it's a challenge. Um, it's, it's a process that we're still working through to develop. Um, but we, one of the things we made, really made it clear, and which is why we ended up with Boston University, is we were concerned about conflicts of interest, not just on the financial side, but the intellectual property side, right? If we went with an accelerator that was a large pharma company and they had access to information in advance, we're gonna do some demo days once we have the companies actually out there, they're gonna be able to give pres presentations. But one of the things Carbex core members know is they're not allowed to provide access to information before the company makes it public. The company can make it public, they can talk to investors and others, but we're going to be really tight on what we communicate internally to make sure we're not giving advanced knowledge on a technology to somebody else. I mean, it's, a, it's a tight ecosystem. We're trying to find that balance, but I think we have a good plan for it, and we're going to continue to evolve and make changes as we go. Good question. That one kept me up at night. Yes, sir. Yep, sorry. Uh, you know, just, just to say that we're starting to think about how we're branding it, uh, which is why I put Carbi up there. Um, Joe Larson has been working on this um, with other members, including Kevin Anderson and John Rex, who are on our CarbX team, are really the thought leaders in this. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of work coming out of uh, the IMI initiatives over there. Um, and you know, there's a Duke Mongolo study report that just came out. I think what we're really saying at BARDA is we're kind of letting the models flow themselves out. We're getting involved in those concepts. And we're saying whatever we end up with, we can be the implementer, right? Because we are already partnering with the late stage product developers. Uh, so if it's a market entry reward, we could step into that space. Um, but we're also trying to define the position. I think my personal concern with it is um, we're fundamentally changing the market as soon as we do this. So we need to make sure it's sustainable. We can't have this a hook that in five years, Congress has to reapprove authorization for it, right? And, and because you're gonna change your business model and how you're expecting to market and stewardship and all the other access provisions of uh, an entry reward, but at the same time, you need to know that that's a commitment there. So I personally like commitments that are more based on treasury and revenue base, even some credits that comes out if you don't have revenue to make sure that it's not something that Congress has to appropriate every year. So we're trying to kind of find that balance in, in the model because I remind people that we're fundamentally changing the model and we also often don't understand the unintended consequences of when we change those models, you know, and what will that, that mean and how do we make sure we model those. Would that include a policy as well as funding? Yes. All right. Thank you very much.